last speaker for this session, Dr. Holtkamp. Uh, you're setting up there? Okay. So Dr. Holtkamp is a professor in the Department of Veterinary Diagnostic and Production Animal Medicine, the VDPEN, in the College of Veterinary Medicine at Iowa State. And he received his DVM uh, and Master's in Agriculture in, in Economics and Bachelor's in, in, in Agriculture Business with a minor in Statistics, all from Iowa State uh, University. Dr. Holtkamp's research focuses on managing infectious diseases, uh, swine diseases, biosecurity, disease risk assessment, and the economics of animal health and disease. So, Dr. Holtkamp, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Ed. Uh, give you a chance to get that up there. All right. So, as, doc, as uh, Edison mentioned, I'm going to be talking to you about identifying biosecurity hazards. But to get this uh, set up, we're uh, going to talk a little bit about why that's important. And there was um, um, good presentations this morning that really kind of set this up, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, uh, indicate why that is. But these are the three things we're going to cover today. Why is biosecurity so important for the U.S.? Uh, who is responsible for preventing outbreaks? And what can you do then uh, to uh, prevent outbreaks? So why is it so important? And this was what was really set up nicely this morning, I think. But the big one, in, in my opinion, is this one, right? Uh, uh, if we get African swine fever virus, even foot and mouth disease, classical swine fever in this country, 30% um, of our pork production is exported. That has to come back on the domestic market. And some of you in this room, maybe me, are going to be doing different jobs, right? Not all of us will be able to do that. It, it especially comes down to how quickly we can get, uh, get, discover it, how quickly we can contain it, and uh, Dermot Hayes has done some nice work in this area. And at the end of the day, that's the cost. What that ends up costing us total will depend on how long it takes us to get uh, those export markets back. And so it all comes down to biosecurity, surveillance and biosecurity to slow that um, uh, or to shorten that time. So Steve Weiss talked a lot about this this morning. He showed some really nice charts. Uh, that showed top to bottom cost of production, revenue, profitability, um, incredible range there, right? Get some really profitable producers uh, in any given year and, and some really not profitable producers. This year, or maybe or last year, everybody was probably pro unprofitable, but, but some more or less there, right? Um, and he, I thought it was interesting. He identified several uh, factors. He ranked them. He had risk management number one as a reason for that variation. Uh, and then he had health number two. I, I'm not sure I would rank in that order. I might put health number one, especially today. Uh, but certainly risk, risk management has a lot to do with that as well. Uh, but we recently updated the cost of PERS here. It's uh, uh, annual cost in the US. Uh, it's uh, 1.2 billion now. That's a little, almost double from what it was the last time we estimated it in uh, 2010. And so clearly that indicates that health uh, has a lot to do uh, with how uh, profitable producers are in the cost of production. So it has a lot to do uh, with competitive, uh, domestic competitiveness and how profitable, profitable you're going to be. And so how companies manage it, that then will, will in large part determine that. And, you know, we, we've spent a lot of time with this virus. Uh, almost all of my career, it's been around. I've uh, made a pretty significant part of my research um, based on, on uh, PERS virus. And you know we're just not getting better, and I don't think we're going to get better uh, at controlling it, right? And, and it's one of those viruses that has what I call uh, evolutionary intelligence, right? It, 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 every time we think we got something figured out uh, how to control it, uh, it, it uh, quickly informs us otherwise, right? And so uh, when it comes down to how to deal with it, I, I really do think we need to reallocate resources away from trying to control it after we get it to trying to prevent it in the first place. Uh, and then global competitiveness. Um, you know, mortality is a challenge. That was pointed out again uh, this morning. Uh, no doubt about that. It's a challenge and, and some of the MetaFarms data indicates that's leveling off. I'm not so sure that that's the case. I hope it is, but, um, but we, uh, I do some global benchmarking every year with Dermot Hayes and Lee Schultz here um, at Iowa State. Uh, uh, Lee's actually going to be leaving us here, and, uh, but we'll still be involved in this, he tells me. But we get some data, financial and production data, from various countries. Um, there's a group called Interpig that puts this together every year. 
uh, and, uh, and then they, the agreement is, is that everybody contributes and then they all get to use it as they see fit. And so you can see here then in 2022, we're over here uh, on the left, the US uh, was in the number two position only to Spain. The red bars there represent uh, birth to market mortality, so pig mortality, and then the blue bars represent sow mortality. And in 2021, when we did this, we were the number one spot. So the only reason we're number two is Spain has had some pretty significant problems with Rosalie and other PERS uh, isolates there as well. Uh, the other thing to point out here is uh, you look at the right there, Brazil. Of course, Brazil doesn't have um, uh, PERS virus. I don't, Edison, I've always wondered why all, all you Brazilians are coming over here to study PERS virus. It must, you must not think there's enough challenge in Brazil, I guess, huh? <laughs> So, you know, that, you'll note there, there, you know, some of the lowest mortality of all the countries, in fact, number one in Santa Catarina, MT is Mato Grosso there. But that has very significant implications for us because, uh, as it was also pointed out several times uh, today, uh, at least in the presentations I listened to, um, you know, Brazil for the last, I think, five years has had record exports, right? They are, they are be quickly becoming a very... Uh, prominent player uh, in the global pig uh, market, uh, and in particular, as Europe uh, looks like it's in trouble a little bit, uh, Brazil is stepping in. And so one of the things we do with this um, uh, benchmarking that Lee and Dermot and I do is we look at the various factors uh, that contribute to profitability. And so we look at things like market pig prices that producers pay, feed price, or, or that get, they get, feed prices they pay, um, fixed cost, labor usage, labor wage rates, and productivity is one of those factors. And so what we do to uh, analyze this is we have a, a model set up for each country. And we start by setting every country equal. So we take the average for every variable we plug in and we give that to every country. So they all start out uh, in the same place. And then we allow each factor to change, uh, to, uh, we allow each, the country for each factor to have its own values, right? So for productivity, we look at breed to market, so all of the productivity in the breeding herd and grow, growing pig uh, herds, and we give the country its own productivity, and then we just look at what, that, what impact that has on their profitability, okay? And so you can see here, uh, the U.S. has a minus eight cents per, that's measured in kilograms on a uh, per carcass weight basis, okay? That means that compared to an average country, a hypothetical average country, um, closest one to it this year would be Austria there with a one cent advantage. But compared to a hypothetical average country, U.S. has relatively lower productivity and it costs us eight cents in terms of profitability. Eight cents per, I'm sorry, yeah, this is per pound of uh, carcass weight, okay? Up here you got Brazil, both in Santa Catarina and Mato Grosso. They're at an eight uh, and 11 cent advantage. And so if you look at that gap between Brazil and the U.S., uh, it's uh, between 16 and 19 cents per pound on a carcass weight advantage, right? So what that means is that we spot Brazil a 16 to 19 cent per pound advantage on the world market just because of productivity, okay? That not, has nothing to do with their low feed costs, the, the low wage rates they pay, uh, the lower feed, uh, they have actually low fixed costs as well. It has nothing to do with that. It's strictly productivity. That's the, the advantage we, we spot them, okay? And I, I say them, we spot Edison over here. So. <laughs> All right, and, and again, that you know, that's shows up, right? They're, they're quickly becoming a global player on the market. All right, so impact on you directly. So we, got, we looked at uh, sort of the domestic market, global market, but what about you personally? What, if, we, if you had fewer outbreaks of PERS virus and PED, uh, would it make your job easier? Would it make your life easier? Would you feel like you were more productive in, uh, in your job? Uh, would you feel better about the welfare of the animals under your care? Okay? And so some of these things have direct implications for, uh, for us individually as well. So here's the heart of it. Who's responsible then for preventing outbreaks? Okay? Um, this is, I would argue, is the linchpin slide of this presentation. If you don't remember any other slides, remember this one. Um, and that is specifically veterinarians cannot be the only ones responsible for biosecurity. Okay? I will tell you if that is the case, then we will never get anywhere. Maybe that's arguably why we've struggled with this so much. 
but they need help identifying uh, what, what we're going to describe as biosecurity hazards and then uh, implementing control measures then to address those. And so I'm going to say if you're in pork production, if you're in the barns on a regular basis, um, you make decisions every day that either create or reduce biosecurity hazards. Okay? And even if you're not in barns, do we have anybody that schedules trucks or uh, uh, sits behind a computer most of the day and makes decisions? You're making decisions that will create or reduce biosecurity hazards on a regular basis, right? And, and so the veterinarians can't be everywhere. They can't be looking over your shoulder all the time and, and saying, hey, 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 that's, that's a bad idea. You're going to create a biosecurity hazard. It just not, doesn't work that way. It's never going to work that way, right? And, and so what I'm going to try to convey to you today is that it's important that you have, let's say, the same perspective that a veterinarian would have who is, you know, sort of held accountable for biosecurity on a regular basis. You have to have the same mindset. You have to have the same uh, thought process when you're going about your daily, daily work. Okay, so that's what, that's my challenge to you. Okay, and it, I know that I, I know I won't change your mind today probably about that, but it, I, I want to start have you start thinking about that at least. Okay, and so what can you do to improve biosecurity? And we'll talk about this a little bit. Um, learn how to identify the biosecurity hazards, and we'll talk about what what that means or what a hazard is. Uh, and then learn how to avoid or, or uh, reduce those biosecurity hazards uh, by implementing some sort of control measure. And it, it, now, I'm not talking about like you're going to have to build a shower or something like that. I'm talking about simple decisions that you might make or not make in, uh, on, your, on your daily, uh, in your daily work. All right. And so uh, this, a lot of the concepts I'm going to talk about here are from uh, outbreak investigation uh, program, a program that we have. Uh, Al, this goes all the way back to 2012 when uh, we were doing this for the Iowa pork producers. And, uh, you know, for many years early in my career, I worked with surveys and tried to, biosecurity surveys, and, and, and we tried to sort out, you know, where are the opportunities to improve, where should we prioritize, and I just never felt like we were doing that very well. Uh, survey, actually I've come to the conclusion, a survey alone is never going to get that answer for you, right? You really got to get out there and and kind of study what's going on, and that, that's uh, outbreaks or opportunities to do that, to go out and do an outbreak investigation. And so um, I'm going to introduce you to some of the concepts and terminology from that. Uh, and again, they, uh, they are what I'm going to suggest to you. You can use those same concepts uh, every day to identify biosecurity hazards. Okay, and so HACCP, if you're not familiar with that, with that it's used in the food industry uh, to identify, um, basically to keep bad things out of your food, okay, bacteria, uh, metal shavings or whatever, right? And the idea is that it focuses on the process, right? You, the idea is you can't test every single food product that, that's going to end up in your refrigerator. It's just not practical to do that or cost effective. But you can focus on the process, right? And if you can focus on the process and understand how things are done, who does them, when they do them, all the details, you can identify where the hazards are and then eliminate those, right? And so over time, you're going to have a relatively safe process of producing food. Okay, so the same concepts apply here. Some terminology, pathogen carrying agents. So first we have to recognize that viruses and bacteria don't have legs, wings, or, or uh, uh, other ability, or things to move around. So we have to move them, okay? People move these bacteria, the pathogens, and so they, they move on trucks, on people, uh, in some cases pigs, right? Pig could be infected with a PERS virus or other virus. Uh, but in general, it takes something like that to move a, a, a pathogen, right? So we're going to call that pathogen carrying agent. So anything that can carry uh, a virus or a bacteria, we're going to call a pathogen carrying agent. When I first started thinking about this, I thought, well, that, that may be a way to organize our thoughts. We'll look at people first, and then we'll look at trucks. So the problem with that is, my God, that's a long list, right? We have lots of stuff coming in on our, our farms uh, in and out every day. And so um, had to get, to get my head around that, we had to move to thinking about, okay, there are certain events that happen on a daily basis or sometimes monthly or sometimes annual, sometimes every second that happen when these carrying agents come in, okay? And, and we can kind of organize them around that. So feed delivery, for example, is an entry event, all right? When feed comes in, the pathogen carrying agents that you might have to worry about are the feed itself, the driver, the truck, any other equipment he might bring with him, right? So all of these carrying agents kind of come in groups in these, uh, when these entry events happen. Um, the, the 
concept then of a biosecurity hazard or, hazard or how we define that depends then on the idea of this three failures concept. Okay, and I'll show you this, uh, that on the next slide here. Uh, and then biosecurity hazard identification analysis is based on how we define the, the hazards and then control measures are things we do to, to uh, reduce those hazards, okay? So again, just to reiterate here, I've talked about some of these things, but pathogens don't have uh, wings or any, any way to motivate or motor on their own or uh, auto locomate. What's the word on me? Auto, loco? Auto locomotion? Yeah, they don't have auto locomotion. Um, so anything, any carrying agent can be either infected or contaminated. When it comes to things like purge virus, where the pig is the only natural host, then the pig is the only uh, one that we can have direct transmission by being infected, right? Everything else, you, your truck, your vehicles, uh, are all gonna be uh, indirect transmission uh, by being contaminated. Uh, here are the entry events on, in the breed to wean phase. Uh, and this is where we do most of these outbreak investigations, but we are doing, seeing more down on the wean to market phase as well. Um, but these are the pretty comprehensive list. I've, I've done probably close to 70 outbreak investigations on sow farms, and I would say 95% of the time that's a comprehensive list there. We can put everything that happens. Occasionally you run into ones where they've got maybe an office on site or a feed mill on site, and, and, and now you've got some additional um, entry events there to worry about. But, this is pretty, um, I would say, is comprehensive on most south farms. And so the key here is that every time one of these events happen, there's an opportunity to bring a, a pathogen in, right? A virus or a bacteria. And so a hazard then, again, is based on this three failures concept. Uh, I'll get right to that, what this is. And, and again, some of this you might say, well, yeah, that makes sense. And I hope it does, right? And I hope you think it's fairly simple. But I would tell you, historically, we haven't really thought about it in this way. And I think it's important to think about it in this way. And the first failure there is a failure to prevent contamination or infection, okay, of, of the carrying, pathogen carrying agent, okay. I'm going to use PERS as an example here. Okay, so um, I'll, uh, uh, I'll, I guess since I already singled you, I'll pick on you, okay. You get, you go to, uh, let's say, a wean to market uh, barn or a nursery, let's say, and you got pigs that are infected with PERS virus there and you handle those, you take out the deads or whatever, you've probably got some PERS virus on your hand, uh, maybe on your boots, on your shoes, and other parts of your body. Okay, so you've had that first failure occur there. Uh, the second failure is the failure to mitigate that, okay? And so if you immediately jump in your vehicle and you go to another, uh, to go to a sow farm um, and you don't shower in, or maybe you do shower in, but you take a very quick shower, uh, and you still got a fair amount of virus on your hands and maybe a little bit on your shoes as well yet or on your, on your feet uh, because when you took your, your shoes off, you step right in the same place you took your shoes off or you where you had previously walked and now you get it on your sock feet. Okay, so the second failure now has happened and you're inside the barns now here and the last failure now that has to happen is that virus has to get from Al's hands or his feet uh, to the pigs in a herd with the minimum infectious dose through an appropriate route of entry, right? So with PERS, one of the bad things about that virus is it can get in anywhere. Every route of entry is possible. Um, and uh, it, in some cases, it doesn't take a lot of virus, okay? But that's the third failure. If that happens, now you now you got problems, right? And, and the key is all three of these failures have to occur. And that works in our favor, right? Because some of these are going to be pretty low probability events. And, and the idea is that we, wanna, we want to make these low probability events, right? But the math works in our favor there. Um, and the idea here is then that a biosecurity hazard then, again, which is a circumstance or action uh, that increases the likelihood of any of those three failures. That's the definition of a biosecurity hazard now, okay? And, and so um, where do those lie then? Where do, where do we find these biosecurity hazards? Well, they're in the production process, okay? What do I mean by the production process? I mean everything you do to raise pigs, everything. Every single thing all the way down to scheduling loads to hauling out deads to bringing in feed. Okay, everything is part of the production process. And that doesn't just happen on farms, right? A lot of this stuff happens uh, in a feed mill or in a truck wash or, again, behind a computer where somebody's scheduling a load. Okay? And so the, I used to describe how we approach this by, uh, by saying we look at the who, when, where, what, and how of things, the production process, how things are done, right? And uh, Kate, Diane, in the back of the room there has helped me refine this more to think in terms of these three aspects, 
okay? Uh, the structural is kind of the where part of that, but that's the building design, the layout. Like, so how's the entryway designed, right? Is it designed in a way uh, that, that it reduces biosecurity hazards or does it not really, right? If it's, there's no bench, there's no booty station, uh, you got a dirty shower and towels and maybe on the clean, uh, dirty towels on the clean side, or, sorry, dirty towels on the dirty side. Uh, what, I, I said that wrong. How about just towels on the dirty side? Uh, things like that, you know, the, it may not be designed very well to uh, minimize biosecurity hazards. Stage loadout, or loadout rooms, right, is a, is a very common one where uh, I can say I've, I've seen very few loadouts, just even if they're trying to do a stage loadout, uh, that are designed well enough to actually reduce biosecurity hazards. I'd say 80% 80, 80 of them are designed in a way to actually increase biosecurity hazards because they go in and wash them afterwards. All the water runs back towards the barn. And so the idea of stage loading is if you had anything on that trailer, any viruses on that trailer, when that, that showed up to pick up wean pigs or coal sows, uh, you want to keep it in that loadout area. You don't want it to get to the pigs in the barn. And the way those are typically designed, they're designed, they slope back towards the barn. Oftentimes the drain is even in the alleyway of the barn or it's right by the door. And we end up just flushing all that stuff back into the barn. And it and it's actually creates more biosecurity hazards than it reduces. So that's the structural aspect of that, the where. Uh, on the right there's the resources, what tools do you have? So sticking with the stage loading room, um, you know, do you have a dedicated power washer or a dedicated power washer hose in there and a dis uh, disinfectant, right? Uh, uh, either a hose end or a pump up sprayer in there. If you have, a dra have to drag it one back and forth between the barn and the stage loading area, okay, that's not really reducing your biosecurity hazards very well, right? So you got, you got an opportunity there to improve resources. Maybe you put a dedicated line in there and, and a dedicated pump up sprayer for disinfectant, right? So that's the resources part of that. And then the operational procedures is the one we typically think of. It's how we do, how we do it, right? Who does it, when they do it, and how are you doing these things, right? And that's the one we tend to focus on most. But, but those, that's where the, the biosecurity hazards lie, is in all three of those aspects, the structural, the resources, and the, and the operational procedures. Okay, now, the, to kind of make this shorter than I normally would here, uh, to save time, I'm gonna go right to the biosecurity control measures, which is okay if you identify them. If you're out there and, and uh, let's say, for example, uh, again, you just, you just visited another positive nursery, all right? Ha do you recognize now that you probably have virus on your hands, okay? And maybe you don't have a shower available, you don't have a sink available, you don't have any soap available, you don't have any disinfectant available, and you get jump back in your vehicle with no gloves, you don't have a booty, disposable booty, and by God, you gotta go to that south farm because you just, you gotta, there's a fire there you gotta put out today, right? All right, what can you do about that? Is there anything you can do about this at this point? Do you have any resources, other resources available, okay? Are there any procedures that you could change there, right? Maybe that's a bad example because I'm not sure what you do in that case, right? Probably not go to the south farm. Maybe, maybe go back, find a way to shower through the office or something like that. But that's the idea, right? When you recognize that you have a biosecurity hazard, and some of these may not be things that you can do something about immediately, some may be, but others it might be coming back and contacting the veterinarians you work with and saying, hey, I think we got a problem here, we need to address this. Is there a better way to do this? Can we find some remodeling that we might do to make the design of the entryway a little bit better? Are there some resources that we can put in there? Maybe you know, a separate set of cleaning supplies here. And, uh, are there things we can do then to, to reduce these biosecurity hazards, okay? But I guess my main aspiration today is that you start to uh, think in terms of where are the biosecurity hazards, right? There's time to get to the control measures, all right? But, but start thinking about those three failures start thinking about are the things that increase the likelihood of the things I'm doing uh, under the circumstances I have that increase the likelihood of those failures. That's really where I want you to go today here. But, but the next step is we can use all these same concepts to start thinking about how do, what do we do about this now then, okay? All right, so just to illustrate this point, uh, I'll, I'll use this, uh, what I call a hazard tail to wrap this up. Uh, these are things I've seen over the, over the years of doing outbreak investigations. And I'm, I'm gonna just stick with one. I have tens or twenties or hundreds of these. Um, but this is one that really, I think, nicely illustrates, um, you know, all three aspects of the production process, um, uh, the, the structural, the operational procedures, and the resources. 
and the situation here was, this is a farm that uh, was located in a fairly sandy area uh, of, the, of the country, and so the entryway tended to get dirty very quickly, had a lot of traffic in there, uh, feed tickets got dropped in there by the feed delivery drivers, um, pig, uh, pig haulers had to stop there to figure out what chute or ask what chute to, to go to, so there was a lot of traffic that went through this entryway here, and so you have the the door here down at the bottom to the entryway, and then uh, people would come in. There was a uh, uh, hallway down here. Uh, here are the showers. This was they were designed then to be the clean, clean, dirty line here, that red line, and then you would pass through here, change boots and clothing in here, and then you'd be in the office. So this is the dirty side of the clean, dirty line. This is the clean side of the clean, dirty line. Okay, and. Structural, so where are the hazards here? So structurally, the way they built this was they had a storage closet in the middle here with a door that led to the office and, and another door that led to the entryway, okay? And, and this was designed as a closet for uh, cleaning supplies is what they used it for, okay? And they had, uh, the procedures here uh, was that the entryway uh, was cleaned at the end of the day, every day, they, and that's how they started. We asked them, you know, do you clean the entryway? And they say, oh yeah, we do that every day, and so then we asked them to tell us how they did that, and so what they explained is the person designated to do that would come in at the end of the day, and they would go through this door, uh, not, not shower out, but they would go through this door, they would pick up the cleaning supplies in here, and then they would walk out this door and clean this entryway, and when they were done, they would come back, drop the supplies in here, come back into the office, and then shower out, okay? so. Re show of hands, who recognizes the hazards there, biosecurity hazards? All right, all right, so you're, you're already getting it, right? Then those are, there's, you know, a structural aspect to this and, then, and also an operational procedure aspect to this, okay? To make matters worse then, they had a single set of cleaning supplies in here, and that got used not only to clean the entryway, but it also got used to clean the office, right? So, so if any pathogens got on that dirty side of the entryway there, um, then, it's, a, it's a nearly certain, or a pretty good bet, they were gonna get dragged into the, the office. So that shower, that clean, dirty line probably wasn't gonna do much for us there, okay? So what do we do about that then? Um, remodel, to start with, a little bit of remodeling work. Um, remove the door of the storage closet here on the, on the outside, uh, for this closet anyway, and then put a, a UV chamber in here instead as a pass-through. All right, and then they added a, uh, another door over here to the second. This, this was uh, actually, I get, uh, it wasn't an empty room, but it had something else in it. Uh, but uh, but we, they put a, a door uh, in there, installed a door on the, on the uh, dirty side, in the entryway. So, so now we got, got rid of that two-way pass, right? You can't get through there to get all the way from the office to the entryway, but instead you have one uh, office, or one door to the office in this closet, and then this door, or this, closet only had a door to the entryway, okay? All right, and then also added a bench. That wasn't really, um, that was sort of uh, tertiary to this, but it, uh, it was another nice addition, another control measure in there to keep that entryway a little bit cleaner. Okay, and then for uh, resources, then what they did was they uh, added another set of supplies, uh, one, one for the uh, clean office area, and then a, a completely separate set of supplies for the entryway that got used or stored uh, in here and used in the entryway, okay? And then finally, the operational procedures got changed. So that person, instead of doing this before they showered out at the end of the day, would instead shower out, and then they would be in their street clothes. Then they would come back in, in here, of course, uh, grab those cleaning supplies, clean it, put them back, and then they'd leave for the day, okay? So good example of how you can uh, again, using that three failures concept, identify where the biosecurity hazards are uh, in, in all the aspects of the production process, the structural, the operational procedures, the resources, and then you can do something about it, right? You put in control measures, okay? All right, so what can you do then? Develop a habit, right? Just start thinking in terms of biosecurity hazards, right? It's, uh, uh, I suppose if you're religious, it's kind of like praying. That just reminds you to think about that, right? Same thing, develop a habit of thinking about biosecurity hazards. Uh, think like a virus who's trying to find a new home, right? If you were a virus, what would you, uh, what would you do, or how could, how would you try to do that? Well, you, first of all, you'd have to find a ride, right? Probably don't have Uber available if you're a PERS virus, but you can find other rides, right? Uh, and then you you want to survive long enough to get 
to the next pig or next population, right? You want to avoid uh, getting, getting wiped out by a disinfectant or heat or something like that. And then uh, ultimately, you got to find your way to the pig, right? And so um, try to identify uh, control measures or reduce or eliminate them. Uh, perfection is never expected, right? It's never going to happen uh, that we're going to be perfect. There's always going to be things that we just can't do anything about or don't want to do anything about. Uh, and then control what you can, uh, use your voice for the other things. So again, this is something where if you identify these, you know, work with your veterinarian and say, is there something we can do about that? Um, and, and kind of think that thought, uh, thought process through. Some of the most interesting conversations I've had in the last five years are, are phone calls thinking through supply entry, right? And you just, if you get the right people on that call, you can come up with some pretty good ideas that way. Okay. And so I'll, I'll come back to this, the supply or uh, standardized outbreak investigation program, or so for short. Uh, now, this is now available online. Um, SHIC has uh, funded this uh, the last several years. It has, consists of forms, uh, reports, and, uh, and a database. And really, the, the, the leap from what I've been talking to you about, and this is what we try to do here is be comprehensive, right? We try to, it's, it's basically an investigation of the production process. And we try to do that in a way that's comprehensive enough that at the end of it, we feel like we have enough information to be able to say, you know what, here's where the biggest problem is today. It might be livestock transport, it might be uh, repair events, that kind of thing. And so you can say, okay, we need to really focus on that first, right? You doesn't say there's not other problems, other hazards out there. It just says this is the one we need to do work on first, right? Because it's like housework, there are already going, always going to be hazards out there, but you need some way to, to prioritize and address the, the biggest gaps first. Um, and so if you're interested in that, uh, there is um, a way to get uh, involved. Just email us at uh, soyp at iastate.edu, or you can email Kate, Diane, uh, if you know Kate, or myself directly uh, as well, and we can, we can get you set up in there. We do have to do that first step manually. All right, uh, with that, I'll thank... Uh, Chick again, for funding uh, that uh, web-based version of, of the program. Kate, uh, our programmer, Kenneth, and then uh, Megan Niedewer and Lisa Beckton, that, that Chick. And with that, I guess we have time. I'll, I'll take questions. Questions for Dr. Holtkamp? No questions? I can start okay. with one. Okay, sure. You showed the economic value. Of course, we have to talk about that one too. <laughs> but yeah, that was a big change from the yeah. previous study. Yeah. And of course, uh, I know it's hard to measure. I don't want to put you on the spot. But what would you, like your opinion? Uh, because there was some 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 changes, like improvements in biosecurity from the previous study to this new one, especially because of PD. Yeah. But also we had like the challenge with that data, I believe, for the 174, right, in that time? Actually, so, that, no, um, well, for the new specifically study. the Lineage 1C.5, or what we used to call uh, the Lineage 1C variant, that actually happened right after uh, the, the end of yeah. the study period here. I mean, the, the, 17, that, the 174 from 2016. Oh, right? yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, yeah, there's... That, so that, that one will be in this but, data, right? It would be, yeah, yeah. So yeah. what do you attribute, like, the, the improvement in biosecurity, but we also had a bad virus in that time okay so <laughs> yeah yeah well i'm going to focus on the biosecurity part of that because uh, that's a that's a there's a that's a big question but um and, and so in, in other presentations i've given uh, i've tried to lay out the case that um well i've asked the question have we Im improved biosecurity in the last let's say 10 years have we gotten better how many would say we have okay and so why do you think we have why how do you measure improvement in biosecurity Okay, that's, that's the right answer. Um, the data doesn't suggest that that's the case. Now this year, uh, if you believe the MSHIMP data, which I think is pretty reliable, uh, you know, we, it was a pretty quiet year. But if you, I plotted the cumulative uh, annual incidents based on MSHIMP data, uh, and it, it's pretty flat line. It goes up and down, you know, there's some variation, but it's stayed between 20 and 40%, okay? Uh, same with, uh, uh, lateral introductions into growing pigs, groups of growing pigs. If they're placed negative for PERS virus, uh, you know, what, what percentage of those go positive at some point before marketing? Um, Dr. Diane did some research in that. It, the answer is not very good, right? A lot of those groups end up going positive, and we're, it doesn't appear to me that we're making a lot of progress on that. 
And, and so the question is why, right? What are we doing wrong uh, in terms of biosecurity? Because a lot of people answer that question by saying, well, yeah, we're putting in benches. We put, every sow farm has a shower now. We're starting to put benches in uh, nursery barns, we need to finish barns. And I would argue, again, the problem we have, it's not that we haven't made those changes or put those things in place. The problem is, is we, we, we don't take the time or we fail to identify the biggest problems, right? Um, a lot of those decisions get made, you know, somebody does a study on benches and everybody puts benches in, right? That's not the right reason to put a bench in. Uh, the right reason to put a bench in is you've identified that employee and visitor entry is a big problem for you and you need to make sure that, that you know, that you make it as low a probability as possible that you're not, you're going to fail to mitigate that, right? Um, and so that's, I, I would argue that that's what this is about. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm excited about this. I, I, like to talk about this because I do think it'll make a difference, right? If we start to think differently than we have about biosecurity and, and take the time, step back and say, okay, let's try to find the problems, identify those, right? And we literally can do that every day. That's what I'm asking you to do, do that every day. Uh, but you can also do it uh, as an outbreak investigation, as a dedicated effort uh, that takes a fair bit of time, by the way. It's not something you can do uh, in your spare time. Uh, but then that will help you uh, then identify or get a pretty good handle on your system and say, okay, this, it, yeah, we need to work on this first, okay? That's, that's the idea, so. So, I don't know if I, I didn't answer your whole question, Edison, but that's, that's a, the part that was relevant most for this. That's okay. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. So my usual response to this is to chastise you for not listening to what I just said. <laughs> yeah, because every system is uh, the same. But having said that, uh, yeah, the things that, that pop up frequently for me are call style removal, employee entry. Employee entry because it's so frequent. I, when I first started charting, it's like, holy cow, that happens a lot, right? And every time that happens, there's an opportunity. And then others are like repair events done inside the barns. Uh, I find those, you know, oftentimes those are urgent, they, emergencies, they need to get done, uh, shortcuts, shortcuts get taken, and even if they got a good process in place, oftentimes it doesn't happen, right, it doesn't work, so, so those are the ones that, that show up most often for me. Uh, interestingly, you know, guilt, entry of guilts and semen, those don't show up a lot. Usually you, you, you figure those out, right, you can trace that back uh, and figure that out, and, you know, I think we really focused on those as an industry probably 20 years ago even, certainly 10 years ago, and, and we've seem to do those fairly well. Not, not every time. There was just recently here, had, in fact, the, the company's only outbreaks they had, and then they had several, were due to guilt entry, right? It just that, that broke down that year, and so it had to, had to get some attention. So, but yeah, those are the main ones that are the most frequent I see, so yeah. What about rendering? Rendering, yeah, yeah, that's, that's another one. Uh, we had a chance to do an APP, uh, serial type 15 uh, outbreak investigation in the growing phase, so nursery, wean to finish, and that was that one was huge in there. The, it, it almost all those sites rendered. They weren't con uh, one of them composted, but uh, but yeah, if you, rendering is still a big issue, right? And and the the um, the issue with rendering is um, that you've got companies that uh, uh, are primarily responsible for picking those up, uh, those dead pigs up, and then. Um, you know, they're going site to site to site and, you know, a dead pig, there's a good chance that's a diseased pig, right? And so you just literally, you probably couldn't figure out a better way to spread pestilence than that, right? And, and uh, so that's a big, big issue. But even composting, I still see lots of issues with composting. Um, but the, I think, in my opinion, one of the areas we can really focus attention is getting that pig out the door. Uh, and and if, we, if we can create a, a solid, clean, dirty line there and not drag stuff back in that might have gotten dropped at the rendering uh, pickup box or the storage area. That's a big, uh, a good step right there, right? And so one of the one of the big things that you, if you have the ability to do this is have a drop off there, right? So if you know most of these sites are built level, you try to use that door threshold as a clean, dirty line. But if you're trying to get two sows out of that door, uh, good luck not stepping over there, right? You, you pretty much got to get it, step over that to pull that sow out of the way. Uh, but if you can create a drop off there, you just roll them out the door and they drop off, right? Uh, the problem there is if, if you got a barn that was designed without that, you know, there's, I don't, 
I don't know, he'd have to move a lot of dirt to make that work, right? So just recently though, about three weeks ago, I saw a design uh, in South Carolina. They uh, had worked with somebody, or not South Carolina, South Dakota, had a uh, local guy built a uh, kind of a, a hydraulic uh, lift for them. And so it, it had a back and then a, a floor and you could lower it to the floor, roll the sow on there, and then it would raise it up until it got to uh, a window, and it would just flip it out. It flipped it out the uh, door, and, and actually it, it sent it a, a, a little bit of ways. You know, it, and if they had the loader there, it put it in, wired in the loader. And, uh, and so we started talking about patents and whether they had that patent or not. But it was genius, I thought. So, so there's you know things like that. That, and again, that's a that's a structural issue, right? And uh, some of those are a little harder fix. They take capital investments, but, mm -hmm. but okay. All right, help me think again, Dr. Holtkamp, guys.